And now, live from Level 5 Productions on the island of Milleronia, it's The Larry Miller Show! Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America, and everyone who goes to a wedding and finds out how beautiful they really are. Hi, folks, and welcome back to The Larry Miller Show. I'm Larry Miller, but in a way, aren't we all? And boy, oh boy, is it ever a beautiful day here in Southern California. The Colonel and I are not on Milleronia today, and I'll explain why. And oh boy, oh boy. It, you know something? I know I've said this before, but it, when it's gorgeous here in Southern California, it really makes you feel good. And of course, there's that music makes me and Colonel Jeff feel so good. That's, of course, the Ely Wiesel Orchestra and the Grace Kelly Dancers featuring boy tenor Brad Simpson asking the musical question, with the resurgence of vinyl records... Has there been a corresponding upswing in records on cereal boxes? Well, that's a heck of a question, Brad. And in fact, I needed Colonel Jeff to remind me, and I did remember, but but what that means is, folks, in the 60s and 70s, cereal boxes had records on the back. And they were, yes, records where you could just cut that out, cut the record out, and just pop a hole in the middle and play it on your record player. And uh, they were usually, as as the colonel remembered, they were usually, uh, well, novelty songs about Frankenberry and Count Chocula with them singing together and sometimes alone. And uh, But they also had, you know, uh, well, real stars at the time, Davy Jones and Bobby Sherman, and they would sing uh, songs there on their own, and oh, people loved it. Kids and adults, too, and uh, and he reminded me, and I and I remembered this one, too. There was one in Mad Magazine, a record in the magazine, that had four grooves and four different songs. So, you know what? To answer your question, Brad, with the resurgence of vinyl records, has there been a corresponding upswing in records on cereal boxes? I hope so. I would love that. I think we should all listen to more records anyway. I miss records. And in fact, if uh, they started putting Grateful Dead records on the back of cereal boxes, I'd be buying all of them. And uh, I don't care what it's for. Product 19 or, well, Count Chocula. And, or both. But, uh, well, good question. Good question, Brad. And I mentioned, by the way, there, Ely Wiesel... And, uh, oh, the great Grace Kelly. I'm going to be talking about her later. And, whew, as you know, uh, Colonel Jeff and I just adore Grace Kelly and have for a long time and will forever. And uh, it reminded me, though, that of, of the Ely Wiesel Orchestra because he was someone who really knew how to put things and really knew how to turn the truth into something that would well, just grip you and never let go. And I read something that was in one of his great books about uh, that we don't think of much. We don't, we don't really let them get to us. And I think we should because, see, tonight starts and tomorrow is, well, Holocaust Remembrance Day. And I remember this story that he told by getting off the train in, well, in one of the concentration camps he was in. And he was just a boy. But he was with uh, uh, several uh, older fellows of, uh, in their 40s and 50s who got off the train with him. And they all saw as they got off, there was a boy being hanged in the courtyard there in the concentration camp. And he was five years old. And this is what they did. They did this a lot. And the thing is that Ely Wiesel noticed and remembered is that The boy was too small to be hanged. He wasn't dying. He was too short and too lightweight and, well, five years old. And several of the uh, German soldiers did, well, something they did all the time. 
that they walked over to him and hung on his legs to kill him that way by the hanging. Now this, well, this sounds unbelievable and grotesque, but well, folks, that's that's what they did. That's why there are Remembrance Day for things like that. And as Eli Wiesel tells the story, one of the men he got off the train with just moaned and in sorrow and said, oh, where is God? Where is God? And another one of the men pointed at the boy being hanged and said, there, there is God. And, well... I remembered that, and I'll never forget it, and I I hope you feel the same way. Uh, boy, that Ili Wiesel and wrote many things that will, made the world a better place, and he certainly had the heart and soul to do that. And by PayPal. That's right, folks, PayPal. Boy, this is a great group, too. PayPal. When you work with them, you feel like you're saving the world yourself, and who knows, maybe you are. And uh, it's it's a great group, PayPal. And and if you enjoy my show, and why wouldn't you? And you'd like to send a few bucks here to help out, and why wouldn't you? You can do it through PayPal. And uh, boy, you know what? And I'm not a big fan of the words like donate this or pay what you like. I always like to say buy us some drinks. That's a good way to put it because you know what? There are different levels of drinking, levels one through five, all the way up to... We're driving to Florida! <laughs> I just love that guy yelling, yes! <laughs> so uh, look for the PayPal banner on our website. We have one there, and that's how you get there. You can get there anyway on your computer, your laptop, your iPhone, anything you have. But don't bother with that. You know what? Go to our website, which is LarryMillerPodcast.com. Who's on the mountain? Tom Mix. <laughs> and I also love the pitch goes down there. <laughs> anyway, folks, uh, do that because every little bit helps us keep the old leg lamp lit. And thank you to everyone who has contributed already and those who are about to. It means a lot. And that brings me to my favorite part of the show, the joke of the week. And uh, this is a good one. I I love jokes and I love passing them on to you. And uh, the colonel feels the same way. And uh, this is a good one. We both like this one. And I hope you do, too. Well, there's a well, a, a nice woman, a housewife in the suburbs, and she's uh, waiting for her husband to come home from work. And uh, it gets a little later, and he's and she thinks, oh well, it's just he's probably late at work. And uh, well, then it gets a little later than that, and it gets to be more like eight or nine o'clock. And she's starting to get a little worried, and she calls over to his office to his work there, and they, well, they haven't seen him, and. Uh, and she's getting even more worried, and she goes to sleep. He's not home yet, and wakes up the next day, still not home. And uh, she gets up, is now no holds barred, worried, and the doorbell rings, and she opens it, and there's a policeman there, and she's, what's going on here? What, what, what is this? What's happening? And uh, he takes his, his cap off sincerely, and the officer says, well, ma'am, there was a tragedy. Last night, your husband was grabbed by a serial killer and murdered and chopped to pieces by that killer. And then everything was just thrown into the harbor. And the woman, she's distraught. She's beside herself and says, well, wait a minute. What, what could the good news be with that? And the officer says that, uh, well, we pulled him up today. And there were four 20-pound lobsters clinging to him. Would you like one? And she's beside herself. How, how could you think that? That's the most horrible thing in the world. It's disgusting. And the officer says, okay, okay. Well, if you change your mind, we're going to pull them up again tomorrow. <laughs> 
I hope you like that. That's a pretty good joke. The Colonel and I like that one. That's a... Boy, these guys uh, thought, well, you know, they they just put them back in because why not? He, he is good bait, apparently. Four 20-pound lobsters. And, well, so sure, they're going to put them back in and see what happens the next day. And so he, he thought he was being just a great guy. In any case, if you like that, as always, pass it on to your friends or family or loved ones. And uh, tell them the colonel and I liked it, too. And that brings me to my second favorite part of the show. The Poetry Corner. <laughs> Boy, that guy with the cough, by the way. Uh, you know, he might get better with a, someone gave him a 20-pound lobster, you know, or just tossed him in the harbor. But uh, this is a lovely poem, folks, by the great Gerard Manley Hopkins, who was an English poet, lived from 1844 to 1889, and became a Roman Catholic convert and a Jesuit priest. So that's always interesting. You want to say, hey, get a load of you. And he became famous after his death and was one of the leading Victorian poets. And this one is called At the Wedding March by Gerard Manley Hopkins. God, with honor, hang your head. Groom and grace you, bride, your bed. With lissom scions, sweet scions, Out of hollowed bodies bred. Each be other's comfort kind, Deep, deeper than divined. Divine charity, dear charity, Fast you ever, fast bind. Then let the march tread our ears, I to him turn with tears, who, to wedlock, his wonder wedlock, deals triumph and immortal years. Isn't that nice? Another good example of what's good poetry and why do we love it? And, uh, well, that's part of the reason. At the Wedding March by Gerard Manley Hopkins. And that brings me to my third favorite part of the show... The Magic Movie Moment. This is a great one, folks. It's, it's wow, what a treat it is always to, to bring something that means something to me to you. And uh, this is a great one. It's a movie called High Noon, one of the great movies of all time. Made in 1952, directed by Fred Zinneman, starring Gary Cooper, Thomas Mitchell, Lloyd Bridges, Katie Girardo, and, of course, the great Grace Kelly. And uh, there's, in fact, uh, when I looked it up on the Internet, there's a picture that's, well, one of the famous pictures of Gary Cooper as Marshal Will Kane, And he's got whew, that whole outfit, and he's marching down there's no one staying with him there's no one backing him and in this town and he's marching down the empty street and you know what uh, that's one of those pictures i said to the colonel you see that picture of gary cooper as the sheriff and armed and with those clothes on and, and you you want to say well folks if that doesn't work for you i can't help you it's another one of those moments of that doesn't work gary cooper as the sheriff in high noon and boy, oh boy, what a wonderful movie. And the, Katie Girardo, Thomas Mitchell again. Katie Girardo is one of the most beautiful and talented actresses ever to work. And Lloyd Bridges, oh, Lord. God, he was good and playing a wonderful character who just wasn't as good as he should be. But this this movie, folks, and if again, Grace Kelly in this movie and any movie she made, you know, if you need more than Grace Kelly, you're on the wrong planet. I mean, you, you have to say, if you were the prince 
like Rainier of, uh, oh, heck, what was the, he, the Prince of Monaco, right? And he just saw her in a couple of movies and said, that's the one. Can you uh, get her over to here, fly her over here? Well, but your highness, that's, you can't just do that. Yes, I can. I'm the prince. But they had a great marriage and great kids, and Grace Kelly, uh, in a terrible car accident, was, uh, was uh, well, was killed eventually. But boy, oh boy, folks, I'm looking at her face now, and that's another holy mackerel. Are you kidding? I'd, ha I'd fly her out to Morocco, too. And I've never been to Morocco, and I don't think I'd even like it. But, oh. And the magic movie moment is, there's so much in it, but but uh, Grace Kelly, who plays Amy Fowler, Amy Fowler Kane, because she was just married. They just got married at the start of the movie. Marshall Kane and Amy Fowler Kane, Grace Kelly and Gary Cooper, and in town there is the great Katie Girardo. As I've said, oh, what an actress. And what a beauty in her own right. Good Lord. And she used to go out with Marshall Kane. They don't anymore now. She's going out, quote unquote, with the deputy, Lloyd Bridges, Deputy Pell, who just you just don't like right off the bat. And he doesn't know how to handle himself. And he doesn't know how to handle any, anything in life, really. He doesn't know what's important. But Marshall Kane is all alone. And he's going up against Frank Miller and his three gunsels, his three men. They all get off the train together, and they came there to kill Marshall Kane. And that's that. In the whole movie, his new wife is saying, let's get out now. We should leave now. And everyone in town is saying, well, don't be stupid about this, Will. You know he's coming for you. You were the one who sent him to jail first, and then... And, and, Yes, get out, get out of the town. And uh, But Gary Cooper's character, and Gary Cooper is the only one who says, I have to stay. It's very dramatic. It's great storytelling. And his new wife is saying, you will come with me now. And you know, I'm not supporting this. I'm not doing anything like this with you or for you. And there's a meeting she has. She gets together with Katie Gerardo. And boy... Katie has, well, sets her straight and says there's no meanness there, but just said, says to her that, what's wrong with you? Does the sound of the guns frighten you so much you will not stand with your man? And we get it. And you know what? So does Grace Kelly. So does Amy Fowler Kane. And in the big gunfight, it's very well made, very well done between Gary Cooper and these four bad guys. And they're there to kill him. And Grace Kelly stands with him. She winds up conquering her fear. And she's she hides out and she's got a, a rifle too. And and she she shoots one of them and helps her new husband save the town and save himself and save whatever's right in the world. It's just wonderful, folks. Directed by Fred Zinneman. And the writer is Carl Foreman, who wrote the screenplay. High Noon. If you haven't seen that, please do. You'll be glad you did. And if you've seen it, no matter how many times, see it again. You'll also be glad you did. You know what? They've all they were all so great in that. And as someone, by the way, a great a great listener of the show, Edward Starkman wrote in and said, Hey, you know what? For your next movie, how about Rear Window? And oh, is he correct? It's an Alfred Hitchcock movie with James Stewart and oh what a supporting cast. Thelma Ritter and oh and the great Raymond Burr who plays a guy we don't know about, don't really like. It's a great movie, very well told. And, of course, Grace Kelly, who once again, if you just look at her in any scene, and he said that's the movie magic movie moment. He wrote in that uh, any scene she's in is a magic movie moment, and boy, are you right. 
And, uh, but see this one, see High Noon, that, uh, as I wrote down here myself, Marshall Kane knows what his duty is, but Katie Gerardo turns out to be the only one who knows what love is. And she passes that on to Amy Fowler, Grace Kelly, and, well, I know what love is every time I just look at her, and the colonel feels the same way. You know what, though? And that's why to think about weddings and talk about weddings is so meaningful, because if you let yourself go and really have, and let yourself be open to it, you realize these are great events. These are very meaningful. An old friend of mine from school, Pete Hunter, and his wife, Marcia, oh, have a beautiful family, and they, and they, you know what, they, one of their daughters, Julie, just got married this past weekend. That's the reason uh, that I'm here still in Southern California, and the colonel's here too, and that we didn't go to Milleronia. I offered them Milleronia, by the way, for the wedding, but they had other plans. I'm not mad. I don't get mad. Well, I get plenty mad, but uh, no, it's wonderful. They're dear friends, and they got together. What an event. It was down in San Diego, and they had the wedding on a cliff overlooking the Pacific Ocean, which, of course, <laughs> terrified everyone there, including me and my wife. You know, they're thinking, holy mackerel, you know, it seems like, I mean, that's a, that's a real cliff, by the way. That wasn't like a fake cliff that, you know, just, hey, six feet below is a lot of sand. No, this is a real cliff, and it was high. And uh, still, I just want to kind of thing. You say, hey, that's gorgeous place to have a wedding. And then you tiptoe behind a rock to throw up because you think that I don't want to fall off the cliff. It's wonderful. And they hired a big bus. They invited all of their old and my old, the same people. Pete and I were great friends at school and we were in the same fraternity. And they invited a bunch of the other fellas from the same school, same fraternity. And we're all dear friends since we first met. Oh, all those years ago, and we all sat at the same table, which is wonderful, by the way, to realize that, well, so I guess we're at the older guy table, you know, the one that's sort of in the corner, the one where everyone who, whoever just got married or the folks who were 19, 21, 22 can look over at our table and just think, so do those guys own something? Why would they be here? It was wonderful, and boy, oh, boy. My dear friends and their wives, who were gorgeous, by the way, I'd known them very well. And whew, they was at a nice hotel with good sleep, great food, and these these great great friends I hadn't seen in so long with their with their wonderful, cool, funny, beautiful wives. And we all sat at the same table, and I was asked to tell my coffin story. This is one of those. Uh, College stories that, at the time, you don't think is uh, <laughs> really going to be that good. It was when, uh, at the end of freshman year, we had all pledged Chi Phi, all these friends of mine and I, and uh, and uh, we pulled, I can't even remember what it was, I and a few of my friends pulled a prank, sort of a practical joke on somebody, one of the upperclassmen, and this is near the end of f freshman year. And I don't, I must have said this at other points, I, I'm not even a fan of practical jokes, but that's all right, you know, I don't like them played on anyone else. I, I just don't, I never quite got the point of a practical joke. And uh, this time, after that, after that event, whatever we did, and I can't even remember what it was, and uh, I went over to the, to the house, the fraternity, and because there's a pool table down in the basement in the goat room the goat a goat was the word we all used on in every fraternity there to make to mean a meeting a fraternity meeting well let's we're going to go to the meet in the goat room on Wednesday night and we're going to have fraternity goat as i said a meeting and it was a big room and at one point in, in fact when i was there sophomore year then the year after this that uh, i painted the uh, greek letters in big and under the arches there it's a it's a beautiful room and pretty big too about 40 feet by 80 feet and with a pool table on one of the sides there 
And as I'm playing with uh, uh, two or three of the upperclassmen, you know, it's about it's about eight o'clock at night, and we're just shooting pool there. And uh, suddenly, it struck me: this doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel exactly right. What's going on here? It's not kosher. Something's wrong here. But I didn't know what that was. And sure enough, because there's only one big entrance to the goat room on the other one of the other walls. And sure enough, a few minutes later, five or six other upperclassmen come in the room and close the big door. And that's sort of like a King Kong door, one of those. They close that thing. And I, oh boy, this doesn't, I just, I knew this didn't look good. And, and, and uh, I just looked up at the, so this is about nine or 10 of these fellows, upperclassmen. And before I can even say a word, they run over and grab me. And one of them, one of them, I'll, I'll never forget, one of them leans over and just says, first of all, don't scream. Don't do anything wrong. And I, I knew what he meant. I wasn't going to do that anyway, but, but it was good that he tells you things like that. And then, folks, they took all my clothes off. All. And I don't mean some of them, and I don't mean they left me socks. I'm t- all my clothes. So you're, well, in the, what, the old phrase, the birthday suit. And then they brought out something for me to get in, which was a coffin. And I don't know about you, but that was not high on my list of well, not on my to-do list. Well, what are they called? the bucket list? What do they call that? To be naked in a coffin, and they put me in the coffin, and they started. They painted me and poured on me, oh, tar and paint and red, black, you know everything. It was just all covered, and I mean covered, not just on the chest. And I'm in the coffin, naked. But this was about six, seven inches high inside the coffin there of gunk. And I'm covered with it. And then they closed the coffin, which I understand is what you want to do with a coffin every so often. And uh, they closed it and locked it and picked it up and carried me to the courtyard in between James and Stearns, which were freshman dorms. And that's a ways, by the way. That's about a half mile across campus. But they did it, and uh, they put me down on a little, well, in in the courtyard there on some sort of tablette, and it's a coffin. And there's a symbol on the front of the coffin. They painted something on it, and they, all right, now we've done this. And they went back to the fraternity and called the fellows at the table from this wedding I was just a few days ago because that was where their freshman rooms were, in those dorms. And they called him up and said, all right, Larry's outside in the courtyard there. Go get him. And they, the guys, who be, you know, my, my good friends and my close friends, my dear friends, didn't come out to get me because, and because I can understand this, they thought it was a trap for them. They thought all the upperclassmen had laid a trap and was saying, hey, come on outside. Come on out to the courtyard. There's something you want to see. So they didn't go out. And I can understand that. They thought they were going to, well, wind up with a blindfold on an island somewhere. And I thought I would. But, I mean, I'm in the coffin. And now it's, well, about eight eight thirty at night and cold. Remember, I'm in the coffin, which is locked. I'm naked and I'm covered and deep in like a pool of gunk. And an hour or so later, the upperclassmen called these guys again and said, hey, what are you doing? Larry's out there, you know, and go out and get him in the courtyard now. Go get him now. But they didn't go again for the same reason. They thought, oh, no, they're mad now. They're really going to, you know, do something nefarious to us. And folks, they didn't go out. And at two in the morning, is that long enough for you? It was long enough for me. At two in the morning, they called again. The upperclassman said, what's wrong with you? He's out there. It's freezing. Go get him. And they they believed them at this point. And those friends of mine just stuck their heads out and saw, well, a coffin. 
and went out, got it, knocked the lock off, you know, with a big hammers, and bam, 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 opened it up, and sure, there I, I'm inside there. I, I, I looked, I, I, I had as many colors as the stuff they put on me, and I was pretty cold. And they, they took me in, in, in the coffin, they picked it up, took it inside their dorm, put it down in the hallway there, and then, well, I was, I was shaking, but, uh, I don't want to make this sound worse than it was, you know, but I was, well, you know, you've been in a coffin covered with gunk for eight hours, you know, that's, uh, I think that's enough. And they, they picked me up and took me into the shower in the hallway there. That was the shower all the freshmen used. And they put me in there and brought in some soap and shampoo and stuff and a couple of clean towels. And I, well, I had a, what I can only describe as a great shower. It was just terrific. And I, well, washed off and soaped off and rubbed off all the gunk. And uh, it was everywhere, as you can imagine. And then I uh, shampooed. I had a well, big full head of hair at that point. And, uh, and then they, uh, it was a long shower. It was about, the shower itself was about a half hour. Well, you know, wouldn't you take that long? And uh, then when I got out of the shower, they handed me the towels and said, what happened? You know, and I said, you know, I was a little, uh, little cold, but I wasn't mad at them. You know, it was a, it was another bit. It was something that we had pulled a bit on them and they decided to pull one on us and they were going to do more. And I was the first one because uh, they, because I was the one at the pool table. And uh, so we did that. They gave me rent. They lent me some of their clothes, uh, these friends of mine in their dorm there. And then, naturally, we all walked over to the fraternity to drink beer, you know, because that's more or less why you why you join. And uh, everyone was, you know what? I gained a lot of points. I was telling the colonel that I really went up a couple of notches in their opinion of me because I didn't scream and I wasn't upset and I didn't, you know, make a big stink about anything. Hey, this is, uh, these guys are now... My family, I'm in their fraternity and they're in mine. And uh, so they were all pleased with that. And uh, I don't think they used that coffin again, (laughs) even for what it was originally made for. But you know what, folks? The truth is that it meant a lot to talk about that at the wedding so that my friends and I could get together and, uh, well, we could go over to the, the food. The food was terrific. And drinks anything you wanted. And the band was great. I'm telling you, this was the best band I've ever heard, ever. And this was, there were seven or eight pieces. Drummer was the best I've, and I was a drummer. And I said, you know, this guy is good. This guy is driving that music. And we all had a wonderful time. And the bus, my friends, the Hunters, had gotten a bus that would picked us all up at the hotel, took us all to the cliff for the wedding, not to throw us off. We thought they might, you know, just drive the bus off the cliff. But then, after that, after the wedding, got back in the bus, and the bus drove us to the reception. And the bus stayed there, too. And after the reception, about 11.30 midnight, well, we all got back in the bus, and the bus drove us back to the hotel, which was about a half hour, so... All I'm saying is really nice of them. A beautiful wedding made me and everyone there remember how great a wedding is and what it's for. And folks, I offer you that as a gift. Remember how great the wedding is when you go, whether it's a friend's child or, well, a young friend, whatever it is. Remember, that means a lot. When they stand up there together, And they are joined that way, and whether it's a cliff or not, it was beautiful. A really nice evening, folks. I know that, and you know what I know. Homer is Homer, and Pluto is a planet. So remember, as always, If you walked out of bed today and had a job to go to and a home to come back to and someone there who cares about you, folks, the game's over and you've won. Remember that. 
Wedding or not, and we'll see you here next time. <laughs>